as we share in the gospel message today that comes from John's gospel. Hear now these words. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, the son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated as we now receive God's tithes and God's offering to support the ministries that will care for God's sheep, God's lambs. Say. 
You may be seated. You know, in almost every city that you go into these days, you see lots and lots of specialty stores, stores that only sell certain things. I remember many years ago, Richard and I went to a store called Just Tile. We walked into the store and Richard was kind of taken by the sales lady. And he looked at her and he said, well, I'm wondering what kind of wallpaper y'all sell? And she said, uh, we just sell tile. And he said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I got that. All right, yeah. Well, what about paint? Is there any kind of paint color I can buy here? And she said, uh, we're just tile. I looked at him and went, excuse me, honey, <laughs> just tile. We're here to buy tiles. There are specialty stores around that only sell certain things. Well, there is a specialty store that I went into one day that only sold lights. All sorts of lights, lamps, lights, chandeliers, lots of different lights. Some of them were plugged in so that you could see how well the lights shined. Others were not plugged in yet. Some were hanging up on the wall. Some were still in boxes, looking all around at all of these different lighting fixtures that you could buy. There was a mother there with her little girl, and she looked down at the little girl, and she asked her daughter which one of the lamps she liked best. And the little girl very innocently said, I like best the ones where the lights shine out. I like best the ones where the lights shine out. I've thought about that phrase a lot as I think about the state of the church today and how we are called to be the light of Christ in the world around us. I understand that there are over 330,000 Christian churches in the United States of America right now. Some of those churches are beautiful, historic churches like this one. Some of them are new, modern churches. Some of them are churches that meet in schoolhouses or movie theaters that have been abandoned or that are free on Sunday mornings. Some of those churches are plain looking. Some of them are very ornate with icons all over the place. Some of them, my friends, are plugged in. And some of them are plugged in where the light only shines for the people who think the same way and look the same way as the people who are gathered in that space. When I think about the light in the churches, I believe God likes best the ones where the lights shine out for all the world to see. But what does that really mean in a world like the one we live in today? How do we shine our light out brightly in a world that in many respects is frozen by fear, flawed by distrust, fractured by division and dissension? A world where every day it seems we are helplessly and hopelessly teetering on the edge of disaster. We get overwhelmed with the amount of difficulties going on in our world. But this world that we live in today is not much different from the first century world that Jesus and those first disciples lived in. In the world that the first disciples and Jesus faced, Jesus understood the difficulties of the world, and he still charged us to be his light in this world. In the scripture passage that we read today and that Swan so beautifully shared with the children, it took place after Jesus' resurrection. After the disciples had already seen the resurrection, Lord, and yet where were they? And what were they doing? They were back as fishermen in their boats. 
fishing all night as if those three years that they spent with Jesus had never happened. Back to their daily routine, just minding their own business. Back to their original lifestyle and way of life. And Jesus comes to them on the beach and he calls out to them and he reminds them, hey folks, we've got work to do. All that you saw me do has been entrusted to you. Continue to follow my way of life my way of life that tells you to shine my light of love and hope and joy into this world by feeding my sheep, tending my lambs, take care of the people around you. Remember how I told you at the Last Supper that you are to love one another, that I have given you examples of how to live and how to love and how to shine that light in the world. Remember, you have work to do. The Bishop of the South Carolina Annual Conference, Bishop Jonathan Holston, has been speaking around the state recently, holding different meetings with lay people and clergy, and he has hammered in the same theme every time I have heard him speak. His theme has been simply, let's go. Let's get about the work that God has called us to do. Feed the sheep, tend the lambs, shine the light, love one another. And I wonder why it's so hard for us to do that. We hear it over and over again. Maybe it's because we don't know what that really is supposed to look like in the world that we live in today. I hear many people saying that they're praying for the future of the church, they're praying for our nation, they're play, praying for the political atmosphere, they're praying for the people in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza and all around the world, the people of Ecuador, the people in Haiti. But I believe that God is calling us to do more than simply pray. God is calling us to bring about change in whatever way that we can. And maybe sometimes we think it has to be a big grand gesture. But dear friends, the people who have most recently joined in membership in this congregation have been touched by small acts of love and kindness as you have reached out to them. Grand things sometimes come in small packages, small ways of taking time to listen to others and to represent Christ to others. I want to share with you a story that a member of Trenum Road United Methodist Church shared with me when I was new in my ministry. She shared with me a story about someone she knew who had been a taxi cab driver. And she said this taxi cab driver arrived at 2.30 a.m. in front of a small apartment building. He said the apartment building was dark except for one small light that was on on the first floor. And he said, under most circumstances, many drivers would just honk their horn once or twice. And if a person didn't come out, then they would go ahead and leave. But this particular taxi cab driver said that he had been in many impoverished neighborhoods. And he knew that people who didn't have a lot of money couldn't afford transportation on their own, and they depended on taxi cab drivers to get them to work or to get them to stores, to get them to where they needed to be. And so unless the situation smelled very dangerous to him, he would often go up to the door and just knock on the door and let the person know that he was there. He reasoned to himself that maybe they needed assistance 
getting to the car or out of the house, and he would help them. Well, that was exactly the case this day. He walked up to the door, and he knocked on the door, and he heard a timid voice say, Just a minute. And then he heard a shuffling as if something was being dragged across the floor. When the door opened, he saw a small woman somewhere in her 80s standing there. She had on a print dress, little small flowers all over the dress, and she was wearing one of those pillbox hats that had the veil on it. He said she looked like she stepped out of a 1940s movie. She was dragging beside her a small nylon suitcase. She said, do you mind helping me put my suitcase in the car? He said, sure, ma'am. He reached in the doorway to get the suitcase and he realized that the apartment building looked like no one had lived there for a long time. All of the furniture was covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the wall. There were no knickknacks on the shelves. He noticed on the counter there was a box, a box that held a few photographs and a couple of books. He reached and picked up the suitcase and he took it out to the trunk of his car, and then he went back to help this older lady make her way to the taxi. He reached his arm out and she grabbed it and they slowly walked to his taxi. And all the while she kept saying, thank you, thank you. And he said, oh, it's no problem. You don't need to thank me. And she said, you're so good to me. And he said, well, I just try to treat my passengers as if they were my mother. I treat them the way I would want my mom to be treated. He helped her in the car, and she held him a piece of paper that had the address of where she wanted to go. And she said, can we drive through downtown to get there? Immediately, he said, that's not the quickest way to go. And she said, oh, I know, but I want to go downtown. You see, I'm on my way to the hospice house. I don't have any family members left, and the doctors tell me I don't have much time. So I just want to drive downtown and see some places before I leave taxi cab driver reached over and he turned off his meter. He drove her downtown and he said they drove around for over two hours. They drove to the place where she said she and her husband had lived when they were newlyweds. They drove to the place where she said she had worked as an office manager. They drove to a building that was now an abandoned factory, but she said they used to hold dances in that building when she was a young girl. They drove to different places where she would ask him, can you just pull over to the side of the road? And then she'd just stare out the window as if memories were flooding through her mind. As the sun started to crest over the horizon, she said, well, I guess we better go. Take me on to the hospice house. As they pulled into the driveway at the hospice house, it was a small convalescent looking home, just one story. They pulled under the portico and two orderlies came out as if they were expecting her. They were pushing a little wheelchair and they helped her to get into the wheelchair as the taxi cab driver opened his trunk and got her suitcase and brought it over to her. When he handed her the suitcase, she said, thank you so much for being so kind. 
and she reached for her little pocketbook and said, how much do I owe you? And he said, oh, nothing, ma'am, don't worry about it. She said, but you got to make a living. There'll be other passengers, don't worry about it. And instinctively, for some reason, he reached down and gave her a hug, and she held on to him so tight as she said, thank you, thank you. You have given so much joy to an old woman. You have made this a good day for me. He walked back to his taxi cab and he didn't take another passenger for the rest of the day. He said he couldn't. He couldn't even hardly talk to anyone for the rest of that day. He kept thinking, what if I hadn't taken that call? What if I had been like other taxi cab drivers and just tooted my horn a couple of times and when she didn't come out, I just drove on? What if I had told her I didn't have time to drive her through the downtown, I just needed to take her on where she needed to go because I had other clients I needed to pick up? I would have missed out on the opportunity of sharing God's love and grace with someone who needed to be touched that day. I would have missed out on being touched by her reminder that what matters most in this world is how we treat one another. He said as he thought back over that day, he thinks there's nothing more significant that he had ever done in his life before, then taking time to notice the needs of another and to place that before his own. My friends, we are all called to feed God's sheep and tend God's lambs. And it may be small things like what that taxi cab driver did that day but may we each have eyes open and hearts opened to recognize when those moments come to us. For there are opportunities like that every single day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may we be aware and have the courage to act. Amen.